Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. If I were more scholarly and nimble, I would pivot away from what I plan to talk about and instead discuss the seismic political, social, cultural, and legal events of the past few days. But I am not, so I won't. Uh, I will just say to the United States Supreme Court, you couldn't have waited until next week, but uh, thank goodness they did not. I will say that the dissenting justices in Obergefell, that is going to be a mouthful for constitutional law scholars for years to come, uh, discuss the appropriate role of judges in a constitutional democracy. And I too want to talk about the appropriate role of judges. Am I screaming? Yeah. Okay. I too want to talk about the appropriate role of judges, but in criminal matters, especially at sentencing hearings in state court. Now, I know it would be inappropriate to ask you by a show of hands for you to show if you've ever been in a state court for a sentencing hearing for any purpose. So instead, uh, what the heck. So how many of you, for whatever reason, have ever been in a state court in a criminal matter for a sentencing hearing? All right, a few of you. I, guess I said for any reason. So let me just give you a quick thumbnail sketch of how a state case might get to a sentencing hearing. And let's assume that Mr. Jones gets arrested in Vermont for a DUI third offense, and the arresting officer sends the paperwork to the prosecutor who screens it, makes a charging decision, files a charging document called an information supporting paperwork. Mr. Jones uh, shows up in court. His case gets called. He has uh, either his own attorney or appointed counsel. The judge comes out on the bench. The defense attorney says, Your Honor, we've received a copy of the information, the charging document, the supporting paperwork. We waive a reading, a whole bunch of other rights, and we enter a plea of not guilty. There's a discussion about bail, and more often than not, Mr. Jones gets released. And then the case enters the discovery phase, and the prosecution turns over the police video and witness statements and the results of a breath test. And maybe some motions are filed. And then the case comes back to court for a status conference, and Mr. Jones is there again, represented by counsel, doesn't say anything. Counsel speaks to Mr. Jones. And the judge says uh, to the prosecutor, are you ready? When will you be ready for trial? And the prosecutor says, oh, three months, Your Honor. And the defense says, well, this is a DUI-3. That's a felony. It'll be six months, and the judge says, this is a DUI. We'll see you next month for jury selection and trial. Well, that has a way of focusing the party's attention, and they enter into serious discussions about resolving the case. The prosecutor wants two to four years to serve. The defense want, wants no time in jail. They reach an agreement for a resolution of one to three years with the opportunity for early release and treatment. And they file a notice of plea agreement with the court and the hearing is set and the judge comes out on the bench and here's what the judge says. says Mr. Jones, I've been presented with a notice of plea agreement. Is this your signature on it? Yes, it is. Have you read and understand it? Yes, I do. Has your attorney spoken with you about what it means? Yes, she has. You're satisfied with her advice? Yes, I am. Judge goes through a series of formal, stylized, routinized questions that all call for a single word response, most typically yes, until the judge gets to, and what is your plea to this charge of DUI third? And the defendant now says guilty. The judge turns to the prosecutor and says, what's the factual basis? The prosecutor says, your honor, on such and such a state, Date, defendant operated a motor vehicle, a Ford pickup truck on a public highway, Route 14, open to the general circulation of traffic. And at that time, he was under the influence of intoxicating liquor, as evidenced by his erratic operation, bloodshot, watery eyes, slurred speech, performance on uh, roadside dexterity tests, and his provision of an evidentiary sample in excess of the legal limit. Additionally, the defendant has two prior DUIs, one in Bethel, one in Tunbridge. So the judge says to Mr. Jones, did you hear what the prosecutor said? Yes. Do you agree that the state could prove those facts beyond a reasonable doubt? Yes, I do. And the judge says, I find that your plea is uh, made knowingly and voluntarily after a factual basis and will enter an adjudication of guilt. 
Prosecutor, is there anything else you'd like to say? Well, Judge, DUI third requires punishment. We think the one to three year sentence is appropriate. The defense attorney says, uh, is given the opportunity to talk. The defense attorney says, Judge, my client is looking forward to early release and getting into treatment. And then the judge asks the one open-ended question that the judge is allowed to ask. Mr. Jones, is there anything you'd like to say on your own behalf? And Mr. Jones says, it'll never happen again. DUI third, maybe the judge's eyebrow goes up a little. Maybe the judge has learned to raise one and lower the other, as some judges have. Nevertheless, the judge said, doesn't respond and says, I'll accept the agreement and sentence you to one to three years to serve. Court is adjourned. So two things to observe about this process. First, the only questions that the judge asked of the defendant were these stylized, routinized, yes, no questions with one open-ended question. Is there anything you'd like to say before the court imposes a sentence? A question that does not develop any dialogue whatsoever. And secondly, under this sentence, the judge has nothing further to do with the case. The judge plays no role in what facility Mr. Jones goes to, no role in what treatment he might get while incarcerated, no role in whether he should be released, and if so, what the conditions of parole or furlough might be, no role in any treatment he will receive out in the community, and what sanctions should be imposed if there's a violation of those treatment conditions. And so we take a judge, an individual at the height of the profession, second only perhaps to law professors, and we, <laughs> sorry, <you're not. laughs> and an individual who has risen in the profession through legal acumen, through problem solving skills, through an ability to understand human nature, and we assign to them, in well over 80% of the criminal cases, a role that could be performed by a computer avatar or perhaps by a robot. That is an extraordinary waste of judicial talent. It is, as the great jurist Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. said, and as my daughter said, stupid. <laughs> I'm not sure that that word was ever used in that context by my daughter. Nevertheless, there, there is another way to do this, a more effective way, a way that utilizes the skills that our judges have. If you were to go down to the criminal court in White River on a Friday afternoon, you would encounter the DUI treatment program. And this is an approach that is supported by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration with funding passed on by the governor's highway safety program. Here's how the change of plea and sentencing takes place in DUI treatment court. The judge comes out on the bench and says, Mr. Jones, I see your signature on a notice of plea agreement. Is that your signature? Yes. I understand you want to participate in the DUI treatment court. I do. Who have you spoken with about it? Well, I've spoken with my attorney and I've spoken with the DUI treatment court coordinator. And why do you want to do this program? Well, Judge, uh, I have some issues and I think this program would really help me with that. So, Mr. Jones, I don't want you to talk about your case in particular, but do you understand that this program is really hard? You're going to be with us for about 18 months. I do, Judge. You also understand that you are going to come back to court every two weeks and that we are going to get to know each other. And I'm going to hear how you've done over those past two weeks. I do understand that, Judge. You also understand that we're going to focus on two different types of goals. We're going to focus on those things that you can accomplish right now, like being honest and keeping your appointments. We call those proximal goals. And then we're going to focus on some longer term goals, some distal goals, like employment, education, housing, relationships, sobriety. You prepared to do that? I am. The judge says, you know what we're going to do today? Nothing else. I want you to think about it. I want you to talk to counsel, talk to family, talk to the court co coordinator, and come back in two weeks. If you still want to do it in two weeks, we'll get you into the program. So the defendant come, comes back in two weeks, gets sentenced into the DUI treatment court. Every two weeks thereafter, for 18 months, the defendant comes back and interacts with the judge. 
a judge who will spend ideally up to three minutes at each court hearing talking to the defendant, finding out how he is doing. And before every one of those court hearings, there is a meeting of the team, the team that's comprised of the prosecutor, the defense, treatment provider, probation officer, and sometimes the arresting officer, to talk about how the defendant has done. The judge comes out on the bench, praises the things that Mr. Jones has done well. Praise it might include just verbal encouragement, might even include a round of applause from everyone in the courtroom. We're very good. Courtrooms are very good at catching people doing bad. We have now learned that they're also very good at catching people doing good. If Mr. Jones does not do well, there are sanctions. It might be an admonition. It might be an essay. It might be work in the community. It might be the most dreaded sanction of all, spending the day in the jury box listening to a whole day of cases. Somewhat ironic or paradoxical that that's what judges and litigators do, but nevertheless, the participants hate that consequence. And if there's a sanction that is, uh, really needs to be imposed in a punitive way, jail, of course, becomes an option. So if all goes well, and it won't go well initially, but eventually, after 18 months or so, Mr. Jones graduates sober, properly licensed, a safer, more productive member of society. So does it work? There are about 250 DUI treatment courts in the country. Recent meta-analysis show that the recidivism rate for DUI court graduates is 60% lower than non-participants. How about cost? These programs are time and labor and personnel intensive, but for every dollar spent on a treatment court, there is a saving, criminal justice savings of $3 for the jurisdiction. So does it work in Vermont? Well, our program in White River, the only one of its kind in the state, is relatively new. But a week ago, last Friday, we graduated our first person. And when she stood up to receive her diploma, she stood straighter than she ever had before. Her eyes were clear. Her speech was strong. She's obtained a professional license since entering the program. She is employed. She has stable housing. She's in a stable relationship. She has reconnected with her family. When she stood up, she thanked the program and the team. And most especially, she thanked the judge. And she said that the team and the program and the judge had changed her life. But I think a more appropriate way to describe it is that the program and the team and especially the judge and the relationship that the judge formed with the graduate allowed her to become the person she was always meant to be before the addiction got in the way. And that is the hope and the promise of DUI treatment courts. Thank you.